your sternum, and, okay, your okay, so are so it's so like sort of feel like your collarbone really and that'll help the right eye more sense of support. So that I should really, I'm going to do that with myself, just feel my own ribs lifting your posture straight. You get uncomfortable in your My name is Emery M. Moore Jr. and this is Exercise and Movement Techniques. Today we are here with Dr. Martha Eddy. Thank you so much. And we are at Movements Afoot, which is on 49 West 27th Street in Manhattan. And you have been very gracious to allow us to come and redo your office mm -hmm. so that we can have our shoot. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even going to attempt to explain all of your credentials, if you would be so kind as to, sure. <laughs> to do that for me. Sure, sure. <laughs> so. Okay, well, quick history. I have a background in dance, as do you, so dance education in particular. Okay. And as I was so fortunate in my college years, undergraduate, to be exposed to somatic education, before it was even termed as such, all right. I became certified in body mind centering and lava movement analysis. Body mind centering sounds familiar to me. Is that Mary Abrams? That actually is continuum that okay. she does. Body mind centering is the work of Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. Okay. And she was an occupational therapist. She still is an occupational therapist. Okay. But she left the field to develop her own body of work, which is one of the somatic education systems. Now that that is a perfect segue because the purpose of this interview series is to try and educate people on the different ways they can take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So what is somatic exercise? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, somatic education is an umbrella term for people that discovered from their own experiences, mostly of some kind of disability, that the medical profession could not solve. Okay how to heal themselves, to put it bluntly. It sounds familiar. So you've got people like uh, Moshe Feldenkrais. Sure. Learning to walk again after an accident. Sure. You have I didn't know that was under the, the title somatic. Yes, Feldenkrais, Alexander, are some of the earliest somatic education systems. Okay. And then one of the things I've been writing about a lot is how the whole field of dance has really informed the field of somatic education. So now, as you mentioned, Continuum, the work of Mary Abrams, comes from the work of Emily Conrad. And she's of the same generation as Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, who is also a dancer and worked with the Eric Hawkins School, teaching anatomy and doing other kinds of movement and dance work. You have this whole group of dancers that were in that next generation from the 30s, 40s, into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're still alive today. So this is mostly a work. dance movement lineage that we're talking about? Yeah, I'm trying to point out, too. Like, the okay. original was these actors and a physicist. So you right, Moshe Feldenkrais yeah. was also a judo player. And then you get this next group that's mostly dancers, and they really had a big impact, like Anna Halperin, Elaine Summers was the first to work with balls. She I was see. the first. You know, she's 80-something years old here in New York City, and people don't know that that founder is right here. I didn't here. know that. Yeah, kinetic awareness is her work, so it was all about being aware of the kinetic process. Um, so, what is somatic <laughs> Okay, so somatic exercise, there you go, is that. It's being aware of your body while moving. So I kinesthetic, see. that's what kinesthetic means. I run the Center for Kinesthetic Education, and we're located here at Movements of Foot. I use my background in, as an exercise physiologist, and I have a doctorate in movement science with a focus on curriculum development. All right. So I develop curriculum that is about health and wellness through exercise. Bringing in this somatic idea means I'm bringing in cues for people to pay attention to their own bodily sensation while they're exercising. That's a big deal now. That's, and it's been a big deal for a hundred years. It's just people are finally catching on. Well, I, I mean, in the respect that Western medicine has almost told us that we shouldn't pay attention, that we don't have the right to, that mm -hmm. they're kind of in the authority when it comes to what is going on with our bodies. Um, I remember reading about the history of uh, Western medicine, and at some point they had actually outlawed that women were allowed to be midwives and to facilitate birth because they felt they weren't qualified enough. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, are you kidding me right mm -hmm. now? And mm -hmm. so I think a little of that or a lot of that mm -hmm. has spilled into the way that my mother's generation, for instance, you were taught not to question 
the doctor was the law, yeah, what they said exactly. went. And now I think because we have more exposure to information, because mm -hmm. we have more understanding of iatrogenics, which mm -hmm. is the doctors making mistakes and people not making it, mm -hmm. that people are taking more responsibility for their own health. Absolutely, that is a key point. I have been saying that a core theme of somatic education is personal responsibility mm -hmm. or personal authority. So you've named both of those. And in particular, it comes from this idea that the soma is the living body. I see. So that's different than the body. The body, you still have a body after you die. Sure. But the soma dies when you die. So the soma is the living body, the body that's able to pay attention to itself. They can make decisions for itself. They can be responsible for itself. So you hit it when you talk about authority and responsibility. Interesting. Yeah. Well, how does that look in terms of, if you want to juxtapose it with exercise mm -hmm. techniques, say, mm -hmm. that you see in a health club where people mm -hmm. are lifting weights or they're doing uh, large amounts of cardiovascular training, mm -hmm. um, any of the typical, you know, move to music until you drop type exercise routines. Right. How do you feel that somatic exercise differs from that? Absolutely. Or is it... It can be just part of a continuum. So, for instance, uh, in my own investigation, there are many Pilates studios that are excellent, and yet only a percentage of those are really doing somatic approach to Pilates. I see. So an example would be, if someone's telling you to just do your 100s until you drop, then you're doing the more typical exercise process. But if they're saying, notice that connection between your scapula to your arm and whether you're getting out of breath, can you still notice the tone in your voice if you're starting to not be able to whistle or hum anymore? Then maybe you need to tone it down a little bit, bring your knees in, that kind of thing. So when they're prompting you to take stock of your own bodily sensations and experience, then they're being more somatic. When I was studying with Kathy Grant one day, she came over and she hit me. <laughs> that is less said, of a somatic approach. She said to me, <laughs> she said to me, you're not thinking right. And mm -hmm. I was like, ah. what do you mean I'm thinking right? Mm -hmm. And what scared me about it was, when I realized was, she was absolutely right. Yeah, she's brilliant, genius. Well, she was, rest yeah. her soul. Yes. Yeah, yes. and uh, I was really fortunate to be able to study with her for the time I did. Yes. But I never forget that lesson because yeah. I... I considered myself somebody who worked in in my body somebody who was present in my body mm -hmm. but not only was it about being present but also having the right direction in yes. your mind to facilitate the movement we were talking about Irmgard Barteniev earlier who yes. was someone you studied with and that I was a kind of protege of thank God and she talks about intentionality in particular, she says, in order to do a movement efficiently, you have to know where it initiates from, you have to prepare for it, and you have to have a clear spatial intention. Right. So she's thinking about, I need to know where I want to go. Right. So that's another example of what you're talking about. And Moshe well, that was also I wanted to extract that. that because for, for people who are not uh, exercise uh, professionals, okay. initiating a movement mm -hmm. is something that a lot of people don't really know what it is. What that means. Okay. Yeah, to actually initiate a movement is to figure out where it has to come from to actually come into being. In other words, you're doing something with a purpose, like uh, Pilates technique, supposed to initiate the movements from the center of the mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. And a lot of martial arts have the same kind mm -hmm. of thing, a lot of uh, gymnastic approach. I consider these to be universal principles. I don't think they're isolated to one discipline. I just think that some of them have better ways of accessing it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe because we have different learners. Mm -hmm. Also, just because that's why I ended up Different studying. people will learn better right. from different teachers or from different techniques. Right. One of the things we're getting at here is that to initiate your movement clearly, it's helpful to have either a good sense of your own body to begin with. Right or a lot of movement repertoire, you know, you've tried different things and you've figured it out, or a good teacher. So teachers can be really helpful to tell you what the purpose of the exercise is and how it's best set up. 
And if they're not giving you that information, then you might just be a little lost, something might hurt, it might be askew. And what we're also talking about is different teachers will deliver the information with different styles. Yes. And one of those styles may work well for you and another one might.